Hello, this is Dr. Nadia Khan, and I'm from the University of British Columbia, Canada, and I'm going to be speaking on this segment about exacerbators and inducers of hypertension. In the section in the guideline, we present a table of different medications and substances that are associated with increased blood pressure. And these substances or medications actually can raise blood pressure, they can cause hypertension, or they can antagonize antihypertensive therapy. It is important to note that the effect of these substances or medications varies widely between individuals. So while some medications or substances may have smaller increases in blood pressure, for different individuals, there can be significantly higher rates of blood pressure um, with certain agents. So in the guidelines, we recommend as for optimal and essential, all patients with or at risk for hypertension should be screened for such medications or substances. And if appropriate, um, we can try to reduce or eliminate these substances or medications from a patient to try to help them with their blood pressure. We're just going to review a few common medications that can increase blood pressure and non-selective or traditional NSAIDs are the more common types of NSAIDs that can raise blood pressure. Also the combined oral contraceptive pill, and this was mostly seen in contraceptive pills that had a significantly higher amount of estrogen uh, in those combination tablets. And select antidepressants, uh, we're familiar with tricyclic antidepressants as well as SNRIs that can increase blood pressure. Now medications like SSRIs on the other hand, tend to not increase blood pressure. And there have been multiple studies and meta-analyses that show acetaminophen when used in, uh, for daily dose and for prolonged periods of times at increased doses is associated with increased risk of developing hypertension. Other medications to note would be antiretroviral therapies. And currently the studies are really inconclusive as to whether they demonstrate an increased or nil effect on blood pressure. So it's really inconclusive at this point. Alcohol, on the other hand, does conclusively raise blood pressure, and that's regardless of the type of alcoholic drink. So wine, for example, also can raise blood pressure when used at increased or higher amounts. And there are limited evidence on herbal or other substances. So we know that these herbal or other substances can raise blood pressure, uh, but there's really limited studies onto the effects of these specific agents. Ma Huang, ginseng at high doses, and St. John's wort have all been reported to raise blood pressure. Hello, this is Dr. Nadia Khan, and I'm a professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia in Canada. And I'm going to talk to you today about hypertension in pregnancy or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. So the hypertensive disorders of pregnancy represent a broad range of conditions, including pre-existing hypertension, gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and HELP syndrome. And these conditions are actually affecting about 5 to 10% of pregnancies worldwide. And most of the maternal fetal risks associated with them occur also in um, lower middle income countries. And maternal risks include placental abruption, stroke, uh, and they also have women that have had uh, preeclampsia, for example, or hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are at increased risk of developing cardiovascular risk factors, including hypertension and diabetes, and also they have an independently higher risk of developing cardiovascular disease in the future. There are also important fetal and newborn risks, including fetal growth restriction, preterm delivery, increased fetal and neonatal morbidity and mortality. So really these conditions are very, uh, have, have very significant sequelae for both mom and for the newborn. So really it is very important that there is accurate diagnosis of these conditions. So that will start with appropriate and accurate blood pressure measurement in pregnancy. So uh, as an essential, 
we've recommended that uh, they use either office manual auscultation or an office automated upper arm blood pressure device. And both of these devices or these kinds of devices really should be validated specifically in pregnancy and preeclampsia. And you can see, for example, on the stridebp.com website, examples of these validated um, devices. And then if possible and if available, it would be optimal to also obtain a 24-hour ambulatory blood pressure monitor and or home blood pressure monitoring. Again, both of these should be validated in pregnancy and the real purpose is to evaluate for white coat hypertension. And when we do investigate women that have hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, it's important to get urinalysis, a complete blood count that would include a hematocrit, liver enzymes, serum, uric acid level, and serum creatinine. Uh, we should test for proteinuria early in pregnancy and again after 20 weeks gestation. And if you have a positive urine dipstick, that should be followed with the spot urine albumin creatinine ratio. And then optimally, also obtaining ultrasound of the kidney and Doppler ultrasounds of the uterine arteries. Importantly, um, there are some therapies that can help lower the risk of developing preeclampsia. And those include low-dose aspirin started at or after 12 weeks until delivery and oral calcium in those women who have low dietary intake. And these are agents have been shown to lower the risk of developing preeclampsia and should be offered to women that are at, at high risk or increased risk and what what classifies that so if your first pregnancy if woman's first pregnancy is over the age of 40 uh, pregnancy interval more than 10 years since their last pregnancy if they have issues with obesity uh, they have multiple pregnancy like twin delivery twin birth or twin pregnancy chronic hypertension diabetes, chronic kidney disease, autoimmune disease like lupus, uh, hypertension in a previous pregnancy, or even a family history of preeclampsia, these women would be good candidates to starting on uh, preeclampsia prophylaxis. And how do you manage hypertension in pregnancy? So really, it's important to initiate antihypertensive therapy in all women if their blood pressure is persistently above 150 over 95 and then certainly at a lower threshold greater than 140 over 90 if women have gestational hypertension or they have subclinical hypertension mediated organ damage and those first line drug options typically include drugs like labetalol or methylodopa or a dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker if women's blood pressures are very high, for example, greater than or equal to 170 over 110, we would recommend immediately hospitalizing um, these patients and starting on IV antihypertensive therapy. And the most commonly used one is IV labetalol, but there certainly are alternatives that can be used, like IV hydralazine, for example, or oral methylodopa is also an alternate or oral dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, and then starting IV magnesium, and also if the woman develops pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary edema, then IV nitroglycerin. Regarding delivery in gestational hypertension or preeclampsia, we would recommend that um, women uh, have delivery at 37 weeks if asymptomatic. And then, of course, delivery would have to be expedited in women with preeclampsia with visual disturbances or hemostatic disorders or if they develop HELP syndrome. Now, postpartum after delivery, um, it's important to continue that lifestyle modification and health behavior change to really try to reduce the risk of ongoing cardiovascular risk, as these women certainly are at heightened risk for developing multiple cardiovascular risk factors. So essential would be to continue with lifestyle optimization and then an optimal, um, if possible, also annual blood pressure checks, as these women also have a significantly increased risk of developing hypertension. Hello, my name is Dr. Nadia Khan and I'm a professor of medicine at the University of British Columbia in Canada. 
And today I'm going to talk to you about hypertensive emergencies. And really importantly, hypertensive emergencies are defined as severely elevated blood pressure that's associated with acute hypertension mediated organ damage. So really emphasize on acute uh, changes in organ damage. And that typically requires immediate blood pressure lowering and typically with IV antihypertensive therapy. Um, other is the hypertensive urgency, which is again, severely elevated blood pressure, but without acute hypertension mediated organ damage or target organ damage. And this can be managed uh, with oral antihypertensive agents. So when you have a patient with severely elevated blood pressure, it is critical that they have an immediate evaluation for the presence of hypertension mediated organ damage. And that would include a fundoscopic exam and really looking for signs and symptoms of stroke, heart failure, cardiac ischemia, uh, dissection, for example. And the investigation set should be done immediately, would include a hemoglobin, platelets, creatinine, sodium, potassium, a lactate dehydrogenase, haptoglobin, urine, um, protein assessment, um, and an EKG. If available, and it would be considered optimal, it would be specific tests given their uh, presentation. So if they have chest pain or an anginal equivalent, it would be important to do cardiac enzymes like troponin levels. If they have evidence of heart failure, then chest x-ray. And if concerned about dissection, transesophageal echocardiogram, CT or, or MRI brain imaging for cerebral hemorrhage or stroke or ischemic stroke, and CT angiography of the thorax and abdomen also for aer acute aortic disease, including dissection. The management is, uh, if for a hypertensive emergency, again, requires immediate blood pressure lowering. And really the principle is to prevent any further hypertension mediated organ damage. There is unfortunately very little data to guide what types of agents and what time uh, we should be starting these agents and also the degree that which we should lower blood pressure to. So it does in, depend on the clinical context. IV labetalol and nicardipine are generally safe to use in all hypertensive emergencies. And we have in the guideline listed out, and I won't go through these in this table, but the different clinical scenarios and then the recommended time to start uh, IV antihypertensive therapy or oral hypertensive therapy, and as well, um, which agents are optimal in these certain specific clinical circumstances.